Solstern, 147 on the imperial calendar, the family of the empress, Countess Etual, was brutally murdered. Count Jared was beheaded. Countess Odra Yerovat died of a heart attack in prison. Her eldest son was strangled in a monastery, and her second son went missing. The Count had a younger sister, the current Empress of Solstern, Rosier Etual, and today she learned that she had been poisoned and might miscarry. Her husband, Cassius, again began to blame her for all her sins, although she justified herself that it was not her fault that she was poisoned. He did not seem to care. He did not try to pretend to be worried about her. He had such a calm look in his eyes. In a moment, she realized that her own husband wanted to kill her, and he did not deny it, saying that she had gone mad after everything that had happened, and in this state, she would not be able to hold on to the position of empress. The girl blamed him for everything. All this happened because he ruined their whole family, and he married her only because she was from the Etual family. But it seems he didn't care that he came from a modest merchant family, and she came from a noble family. He was terribly disgusted to hear noble people boast about their wealth. Even after going through all this horror, the girl did not give up. She was ready to withstand all the blows of fate. But she did not expect this, so she asked him to divorce her, and then she would go to a monastery. But it seems that her husband had other plans. He said there was an easier way. He threw her off the balcony where they were talking, and on the way down she realized that if she hadn't been married to Cassius and had listened to her brother and father then, this false love wouldn't have clouded her head and everything could have been different. After a moment, she heard a voice asking her to get up. So she got up in terror, not knowing where she was and why she was still alive. Rising to her feet, she went to the balcony and saw Casabella of the Red Rose, their estate. A woman named Natalie approached the girl, saying that her dress was all wrinkled, so she immediately began to fix it. And taking her hands, the heroine felt warm and terrified. The girl asked the maid where her father was, and she replied that even though tomorrow was her 20th birthday, it was no reason to behave like that. Hearing this, her first thought was that she was back in the past, but after a moment she calmed herself down by rejecting this thought. Then perhaps it was a dream. The maid noticed the strange behavior, and the pale face of her mistress thought about calling a doctor but it seems that it was no longer necessary. Rosier, right through the servants in the manor, ran to her parents' room to make sure they were alive, and when she saw her father, she immediately hugged him. The mother was not happy about this, saying that even if she had a nightmare, it was no reason to run out in such an outfit. Hugging him, the girl realized that her father's neck was still in place, which meant that he was alive. After hugging them for a while, the girl accepted that they were alive in this world and her mother assured her that she was already in her twenties and acting like a child, and that she would not get married at this rate. Later, passing by her parents' room, the heroine overheard them talking. The Marquise's daughter was paying for her parents' sins. Gossip was rife, but the imperial family was not going to show them mercy. The situation was deplorable, but nevertheless, they were glad that it was not their daughter who was sent to the north. The thoughtful lady walked around in thought, and the maids noticed that something was wrong with her. She should have been happy at the sight of a dress. The fashion designer showed her new dresses, but the girl kept thinking how she could return to the past. Tomorrow she would turn 20 years old, and in this dress she was supposed to meet Cassius, and she would be asked to marry him, and so she had to do something immediately. Otherwise, she risked repeating the events of the future. While in her room, she did not understand why she came back on the day he proposed to her, so there was little time, because they were supposed to get engaged right during the banquet. The thought occurred to her that she had to run away to a foreign country, that she had to go underground and not show herself to anyone, because her future husband wanted to win Etual. It was her last chance, given to her by God himself, so she could not afford to make a mistake. The heroine decided that the only person who could deal with Cassius was King Helivant, who ruled the northern lands, and was said to be half man and half beast, and also possessed by demons, and therefore sewed leather from people. Maxime Lanker, he has never appeared in public, and therefore there were many different rumors about him. The girl recalled that when she received the marriage proposal, the Marquis's daughter Muriel went north that day to become his bride. But she never made it to the estate, and then Countess Ariella could not stand it. 
and committed suicide. This news shocked everyone, and Cassius himself was especially angry. But it didn't matter. The heroine still hated him and didn't think to forgive him. That's when the war between these men began. But now, even if she died again, it was the only way to survive. The next day, there was a banquet. All the guests admired how beautifully everything was decorated. The girl was told that the guests had already arrived. They were Eliza and Tracy, with whom she was very close. But after the death of her parents and her older brother, they completely lost touch. But when they met again in the garden of the Imperial Palace, she talked again as before. They wished the heroine a happy birthday with smiles, but she realized that those smiles were fake, and Heron also came to congratulate her. And seeing this, Rosier hugged her friend tightly. When she lost everything, only Helen remained with her. She was sure that the girl had cried a lot when she learned about her death in her past life, and so she decided to show her gratitude to her, thus showing her attitude towards her other friends. The heroine gave her only friend earrings, which had been previously given to her by her brother Gans, causing a burst of envy among the other girls. And to enhance the effect, she showed off the earrings to the others and said that Heron would become her daughter-in-law in the future. The nanny, hearing this, said that the lady should have taken care of herself, because a prince and many other foreigners were coming today. And then they decided to go to meet Lady Mural, who was now very upset. While putting on the dress, the girl was considering running away to the north, which was a risky business. So she hesitated, and when she finished dressing, she noticed that she looked the same as she did then, so she had to smile as if she were the happiest person in the world, even though she looked stupid. When she went out, everyone praised the beauty of the heroine and began to discuss who they would give this beautiful girl to. She was disgusted to realize that they were trading her as if she were a thing. The heroine noticed Cassius talking to the others present, and she noticed that he looked like a devil, with a confident look that could seduce any woman, and he had clearly managed to charm many people already, although she understood what his goal was here. She thanked him for coming, and then hurriedly moved away from him, realizing that she had to avoid the man, so that he would not ask her to dance, so she had to find someone else, otherwise the future would not change. The girl noticed her friends, who were near Lady Morel, and asked her to dance, although it was clear that she was desperate and the heroine was increasingly surprised how she could be friends with them before, and then took Lady Morel by the shoulder and told her not to worry too much. When the time for the dance came, Cassius had just approached the girl to ask her, when another man beat him to it, and she went with him without hesitation, hoping that she could avoid the prince all evening. The man did not believe that he could be treated like that. He assumed that her mood had deteriorated a lot, but he should not pay attention, as it was just a dance, but did she decide to get on his nerves? The dance did not work out from the very beginning, and the heroine often stepped on her partner's feet, but the situation was corrected by a man who later took the girl away from her partner. It was Gans, the girl's brother. Before he first returned, she was very sad, thinking that he was gone. Her heart was filled with longing, and it was as if he had risen from the dead. She said that she didn't think he would be able to come. Because of his sudden disappearance, she was very worried, and he didn't even warn anyone, but now he was here, and it made her very happy. Still hugging his sister, the brother noticed that someone was watching him fearfully. He recognized him as Cassius and asked if she really liked that hypocritical bastard so much, since there were plenty of other worthy candidates. She knew that she should have listened to her brother then, and then those terrible events would not have happened, so she had no reason to refuse him now and he noticed that she had always done things her way before. Gans only wanted to warn her that Cassius was a bad person, and that she should stay away from him, and she realized that now was a good time to ask her brother to look after her parents when she went away. The man noticed that his sister was acting strangely, but it was dance time, and it was also his birthday, so his brother did not take what he heard seriously, and the girl playfully took Helen's hand and joined it with her brothers, realizing how she felt about him. She didn't understand how her brother always managed to cheer her up, so she walked toward the exit. But when she saw that she was free, the man she had been avoiding all evening approached her, tired of waiting, and offered to talk to her in private. When he went to the balcony, he said that if she was trying to provoke him, she had succeeded. It was the first time he had ever been so angry, 
and now he had a plan for the evening. He wanted to approach her slowly with a face full of despair, to hug her by the shoulders and surprise her by getting down on his knees and proposing, because it was a proposal from the prince himself, and everyone only dreamed of getting something like that. As soon as he was ready, the unexpected happened. The heroine sobbed loudly, thus confusing the prince. She said that she was very sorry for Lady Morel and did not understand why she was being sent to Hellevant, as it was the same as going to certain death. The abrupt change of topic again got on her husband's nerves. He didn't understand why she was throwing a tantrum and said that it was all for the good of the Alliance. It was nothing more than politics. But the heroine did not give up, assuring that she could not just sit and watch Lady Morel being sent to the savages and let the prince talk to his father. But he was tired of this conversation, so he would tell her to watch her tongue. She sought this reaction, and at the last moment when he was about to lose his patience, she said that she would go alone, and if anyone should have sacrificed herself, it would be her. The prince realized in his head how stupid and immature the woman was, and that this was beyond his plans, but he still tried to make one last attempt to change the situation and calm her down. But she had other plans, after which she hit him, drawing blood. The man, shocked by this action, assured her that she would be punished for what she had done, and therefore if she wanted to go to the north, he would not stop her, thinking that she would run away to him before the trip came true. She succeeded. She managed to get away from Cassius and thus changed her future on the verge of hysterical joy. She realized that if she left the prince, it meant that she would not go to hell. When they returned to the guests, everyone was shocked to see the wound on the prince's face, and he approached the Marquis of Montenegro and said that he had good news for him and his daughter, because a brave lady from the Etchwell family had volunteered to go to the north. The same evening, the whole family gathered in the room to discuss the heroine's decision. The mother was hysterical, as she did not understand why she needed to do this and the reason she gave was that the prince would sooner or later find a way to marry her, and she had no other choice. Her parents did not understand why she wanted to avoid this participation, and they would not have been able to understand. Her father would certainly have been against this trip, but it was the only way to avoid bad participation. Otherwise, her whole family would die at the hands of the emperor, and she didn't want to see them die again and go through all this torment. So she decided to go north. The imperial family would let them go when she got married, so she asked them to respect her decision. A little later, this news reached the ears of the emperor, who discussed the situation with his wife. The Etchwell family would be a good support for them in case of marriage, and therefore it would not be easy to find another bride. But the prince should not marry her anymore, and therefore it was decided to send the heroine to the north so that she would not interfere in their family affairs. Already in the carriage, the nanny persuaded the girl to return to the capital and marry the prince. It was not too late, but she argued that if Natalie should not go with her, as it was probably a one-way ticket. But the woman said that no one was waiting for her at home anyway, and the young ladies were her only family. Promising her parents that she would send a letter as soon as she got there, the woman and her nanny, who could not let her lady go alone, set off on a long journey. On the way, shaking with fear, Natalie kept saying that the forest they were traveling through was very scary, and that was because hundreds of years ago, a terrible disease broke out on this continent, killing one in thirty people, and many were buried in this forest, and that is why it is now called the Forest of Death. Hellevant was building up his military force because no one was coming to them, and if you went around the forest you would end up in the sea, behind which was a mountain range, and the forest itself was the size of a large city and there was no end in sight. And then the girl was very interested in one question, since Hellevant was larger than Solstern, so why was it not included in the list of countries of the Empire? Before Solstern, there were many small countries. They used the same language as everyone else, had the same medicine, although there were leading countries among them. But one day they all united to fight against the monsters, and their continent was able to deal with all the foreigners, and after the victory, people decided to call for one leader, and he became the Emperor Stern, and eventually, the Empire was called Solstern, but Hellevan decided to be a separate country. On the long road, the girl thought about it. 
If Helivant had switched places with Solstern, he would have definitely made the Empire his own. The nanny wondered how such barbarians could have become part of the Empire. The girl stated that these barbarians are defending the Empire from monsters, and in general, their country may be deliberately turning the Helivantes into barbarians, since the more they fear their enemies, the more they want to defeat them. Perhaps then it would be easier to simply resolve everything peacefully, although their country will never want peace with its neighbor, nor mutual prosperity, as hatred is deeply rooted in both peoples. She hoped that everything would be fine, because she had been sent as a bride to prove peaceful intentions, and her death could be a pretext for war. The heroine was somewhat surprised to see the nanny almost crying. She was glad that her mistress had wised up, and at that time she understood why she stopped coming to tea parties, preferring the library, although she missed those days a little. Realizing that the nanny was still afraid, the girl hugged her, assuring her that everything would be fine. But Natalie didn't really believe it, as she had heard gossip that a terrible person was in charge. Everyone talked about him as if he was like a devil who wore all black and drank human blood at night. And she had also heard that he skinned people and fed them to wolves, after which the girl laughed delicately, saying that these were just rumors and that she should not believe everything she heard. The nanny reported that the lady was also shaking, which made her feel uncomfortable, as she did not feel fear or other emotions that could be caused by shaking, and then she realized with horror that the carriage was shaking violently from side to side. Then something happened from which they would recover for a long time. They saw a dead knight through the window, and noticed people in black masks who intended to kill everyone present. The heroine was not confused, and at the same moment said that they needed to get away from here, but the woman was in a panic and shouted that they were going to die. But there was no time to wait. The girl took her hand and intended to jump out onto the grass. At the very last moment, something went wrong, and the girl landed alone, noticing one of the killers. She held her breath, hoping not to be noticed, and in a moment recognized the attacker as one of the prince's escorts. But they found her. She was sure that he would kill her. From a man with a knife, she should not expect mercy, and she was already prepared to die, when a voice was heard somewhere telling the other that another man had been found. And judging by his clothes, he was also from Solstein, and he ordered to take her with him. Later the heroine woke up in bed. Natalie was sitting next to her, who said that she had been unconscious for two days, asking where they were. The nanny told her what had happened to her. At the very last moment, the woman let go of the girl's hand and fell in the other direction. They wanted to kill her, but suddenly the attacker's head flew off her shoulders, and as soon as she saw the severed head, she fainted. And when she woke up, she was already here, in the Maxim Lanker castle. The woman claimed that they were treated like things here, as at the same moment a butler entered the room and introduced himself as Freddy, and the girl asked if she could meet the king. The butler assured her that he had gone hunting and would be back today, and that they were here on his orders, and she was surprised by this and saw indifference in his eyes. As soon as he wanted to say that he would inform us when the king returned, it was no longer useful. He was already in front of the castle gates. Looking at him from above, the girl could not understand what kind of person he was. He looked more like a knight commander than a king. Her whole body shook just thinking about him ruthlessly killing Cassius. They were the exact opposite, and maybe even worse. A few days passed when the heroine saw a silhouette through the window, which surprised her, as she hadn't seen anyone here for several days. The king arrived, but didn't even want to talk to her, which was somewhat alarming to the girl. There were no maids, no one at all, so she decided that she needed to talk to someone from the locals immediately. So she dressed in a black cloak and went out to wander around the castle. Taking a candle with her, she went out into the corridor and noticed that there was no one there either. But she saw the paintings, and wondering whose family tree they were, she decided to look at them closer. The gigantic portrait belonged to a girl named Olivia Lanker, who was the youngest daughter of Duke Marcus a descendant of the Solstern imperial family, and if she was a distant relative of the imperial family, it meant that the king also had their blood in him. She seemed to have been noticed, but she did not pretend to be afraid, so she simply assured me that she saw someone enter the chapel, and was suddenly curious, and then asked a question. 
the heroine asked what had been bothering her for the past few days, namely when they would have their wedding, as she was sure that the king himself had noticed her. He claimed that he hadn't promised anything, and then the girl began to recite a speech she had prepared long ago. She was the one who was sent here for this purpose. The empire chose her, so she had to pay her debt, and her husband also had a great responsibility, because Solstern wanted to clarify the situation and create an alliance. And in her mind, the girl was begging him to save her, not to send her back, and how to make him marry her now. The king lightly responded that all this did not sound convincing, and after a moment, the girl seemed to realize that now was the right opportunity, and said that if they were against it, why not declare war? She continued, asking him not to let the poor girl die in vain. She had seen his armies and power. So how long were they going to live with the fact that they were barbarians? They had to be aware of the gossip. The man assured her that he only knew of rumors about the wedding, and then pressed the girl against the wall, as if playing with her emotions, and asked what other rumors were circulating about them, whether they were called demons or monsters, and maybe they were monsters in bed too. He leaned closer, quietly asking if she was afraid of him, but the heroine was not confused, so she said she just wanted to resolve the misunderstanding. On the way here, she also promised herself that if she could not marry him, it would be better to die, asking a rhetorical question about how she would be treated if she returned home like that, a woman who was not accepted even in barbarian land. No matter how strong they are, Solstern thinks they are barbarians and savages, and people think that two countries should not be under the same roof. After these words, the man approached the girl almost close to her. She pulled away from him, saying that she was ashamed when his ancestors looked at them. Smiling, the man assured her that he had never seen anyone like her before, and the girl reciprocated, adding a bit of intrigue to their conversation, saying that she would wait for an official audience tomorrow, but not in such a place, and then went to her room. In the palace, meanwhile, the prince was receiving a report from one of the assassins. They failed to complete the mission because people from Hellevant intervened, the man was very angry to hear the disappointing news, saying that he would rather commit suicide instead of being crucified here before him. Cassius ended the conversation by saying that he shouldn't have left him alive, and then ordered him to be killed. Not listening to his henchman's pleas, the prince concluded that he had a short conversation with people like him. After all, the man in his office was deep in thought. It turned out that Hellevant had interfered, and the girl was now in their hands. If she had sincerely apologized that day, he would have forgiven her, because he knew how useful she would be in his hands. But she didn't just leave. She decided to hide behind King Maxim, and that's when he swore he would get rid of her. Even made up a story about robbers who killed her and robbed her carriage. But it all went wrong. The thoughts were interrupted by the headmaid, who wanted to introduce the new maid, saying that she was very similar to Rosier, but very different in personality. She introduced herself as Sasha and said that her parents had died and that she was an orphan, so she promised to work hard and even give her life if necessary. The next day, King Maxime decided to find out more about his future bride, and was told that she was from a well-known merchant family in the south, and that the capital was built with the money of this family. The head of this family could have claimed the title of duke on his own merits, but they were deliberately kept away from power. But all the inhabitants of Solstein deeply respect this family, and their daughter almost became a princess. Having heard the necessary information, the king released the boy, who finally informed him that executions were scheduled for the afternoon, which were much less than last time. He also ordered the butler to bring the woman for an audience, and that he needed to see her immediately. He led them together with Natalie because the king ordered it, and she was very scared, thinking that he would kill them, and she was going through the worst possible scenarios in her head. He brought them to the prison, and when asked why exactly here, the butler could not answer, and the girl immediately began to remember memories from the past. There, they were met by the vice-captain of the knights, Tulio, who said that he had saved the women from a mercenary attack. Then he snuck up behind them and cut off the bandit's head, and he wondered if they were not afraid to be alone. With cold politeness, the girl thanked the knight, but claimed that she was not interested in him and that she should call the king, adding that his face was bigger than his hands and she did not have time to talk to him, so she left. There was laughter in the hall, 
Someone said that from now on he would be called the big-faced, but the man did not stand for it. One shout was enough for everyone, after which everyone present fell silent, pretending not to have heard anything. The captain of the knights himself, named Richard, also intervened, saying that it was time for the king to stop and have an heir, to which the vice-captain ridiculed the idea as she looked exactly like the last lady, and she would clearly have a hard time. Later, the king himself appeared and told the heroine that this happens twice a week, because as she said, it is a wild land, and so he gave her another chance, asking if she wanted to go back. The girl refused, assuring him that if he wanted to send her away, he should kill her, and he shouldn't have called her here in that case. The man smiled, then held a dagger to her throat and asked her what her purpose was. The girl did not give in to the threats, but decided that it was worth telling the truth. She came here not to marry the prince. She did not like him. He was the devil whom she wanted to kill in the first place, and she came this far only for revenge. Knowing her family's history and pedigree, the ruling dynasty decided to marry the prince to her, and she thought that Maxime was the only one who could stand up to the prince because the emperor already had one foot in the grave. And she had come all this way to use it, the king stated. And the heroine only confirmed this, after which the dagger came dangerously close to her neck, thus showing the seriousness of the king's intentions. She continued her confession, assuring that she was honest in her intentions and no one knew about her plans. Everyone thought of her only as a potential candidate for the prince's wife, and no one took her seriously. So she's a spy, the king said in a cold tone. Then she suggested that they consider her a spy and use her as a hostage, and if they kill her, they'll have problems and she'll only be glad that Cassius isn't around. So all she wants is a wedding, the man concluded his interrogation, thus removing the dagger, and she swore that it would be a beautiful union, and she would even sacrifice her life for this goal. When asked what she really wanted, she answered without hesitation, she only wanted the death of the prince. With it all the threats to her family would disappear, and that is why she would help in any way she could. It was her only wish. The king said in a cold tone that he didn't need her help to get rid of the prince. He needed a woman who could warm his bed, and whether she would agree to sleep in the same bed as the beast. He will not interfere in her personal life. But since he will have to avoid suspicion from society, she will have to fulfill the basic duties of a wife. The heroine was ready for anything, and therefore did not refuse although she added that she did not think anything would come of it. But in this case, he would have to keep his word and help her fulfill her plans. But he should not expect feelings in return. When he finished, he ordered the butler to take her to her room, who in turn warned her that it was only a game and she should not be fooled. But the king had already made up his mind, so he advised his uncle not to worry about it. He would never allow people from Salstern to walk around here again. While in her room, Nanny was still begging the lady to leave, as she did not want to live in this horrible place. But she was lost in thought. She did not know whether Maxim Lanker would be kind to her, because he was behaving this way probably because of his position and authority. Natalie was the first to notice him. The king was on his way here to announce his decision. They met in the hall, where he proposed marriage. And then the problem would be solved by itself. The girl was skeptical, not trusting his words, and then he took her and pushed her against the wall, assuring her that he would use her too. He also had a reason to get married. After a little thought, she agreed. Holding her neck where she had been wounded not long ago, he would have a doctor check her every day, and then she would say that they would be an ordinary couple, and after achieving their goals, they would divorce. Later, as preparations for the wedding were already underway, the king asked Jansen how the process was going, to which the ward replied that everything was going according to plan. But he did not understand why all this was necessary, because the king did not do it on a whim, and it is unlikely that his uncle and Miss Catriana would turn a blind eye. The guy just wanted the king to marry a worthy candidate and create a strong and happy family. He wasn't sure that this woman would be able to fulfill her duty, but Maxime was sure of her. She wasn't even afraid of death. A little later, the butler came into the study and brought a letter from Salstern, so the king thought it was for her, and would have ordered him to give it to the girl. But he did not bother with these trifles anymore. The boy was outraged by this behavior. He did not trust her, and they did not know what her purpose was. 
to which the king threatened him to keep in mind that when the girl got married, she would become the new owner of this castle. Although the servants might not respect her as a mistress because of the gossip, he assured her that she could take care of herself and contribute to the castle, and Jansen and the butler took this into consideration. A little later, the heroine was brought a letter, which she opened with joy. It was a letter from her brother. He had already heard the news, but still could not help at the moment. When she left, their house was filled with great sadness. My mother, who used to be very sociable, withdrew into herself, and my father fainted after she left. All the relatives were shocked by the news, and my father started smoking a lot and worrying about her, sitting in his room all day and not sleeping well. But now, everyone wants her to return home, and fortunately, her friend Helen comes every day to comfort and reassure her mother. Perhaps he thought so, but after she left, the attitude toward them in the Empire changed significantly, and he wanted to raise their family, but because of the turmoil with the Mundo family, this was postponed. Apparently this is not so important to her now. Sooner or later the cart with the cargo will come. Now all the responsibilities of the house are on him. Perhaps he could help her. So he asked me to answer as soon as he reads this letter. The girl thought the name sounded very familiar, but her thoughts were interrupted by Natalie, who suggested that she go and update her wardrobe, and she also noticed that the room was very small. But His Majesty could have taken these things into account. She sat there happy remembering that if they sealed the deal, relations between their countries would improve, and then they could return home. The heroine recalled that a few days ago she was ready to beat him to death, and now she was calling him His Majesty. But the woman said that this was now her home, which meant that she had to draw conclusions in order to live here in peace. And as soon as the lady got married, she would have a child, and she was sure that the child would be very sweet and beautiful, thus embarrassing the girl who asked her not to say such nonsense. A woman named Katrina burst into the castle and asked where the king was, saying that his meeting should have ended long ago, to which the maids replied that he was meeting with the elders. She knew that Solstern was up to something, but it was too much to send someone to be his wife. A woman with the blood of the Solstern family in her came to this castle to bring chaos to Hellevant again. So why did he accept her? Weren't they supposed to? to take revenge on them for everything? Everything that is here now she did, and no one dares to take the castle away from her? The woman was noticed by the butler and stopped her. The man suggested that she calm down, that she shouldn't have gone to the king in such a disturbed state, and the woman accused him of taking the side of the visiting bride. What was the point? They had only just healed properly. Why couldn't he marry someone else? Why didn't he accept Lady Ayla's offer? The woman continued to accuse him. It was disrespectful to them, and she should have told him. At this moment, the heroine was passing by. The woman saw her and decided that she needed to tell her everything she thought. But the butler stopped her, saying that it was all the advice of her own family. She had to be patient and come back to her later. While walking with Natalie, she noticed one of the servants spying on someone through the wall, and the butler noticed it too and scolded her and the heroine saw a man passing behind the wall, and she realized that she had seen a similar expression before. It was Helen's expression when she secretly watched her brother. As they walked along the garden, a woman named Miriam approached them, introducing herself with a dispassionate tone as the head maid, and saying that she was in charge of various matters in the castle. She noticed that the greeting was rather cold, but she should not jump to conclusions. The woman said that she had prepared another room for them and offered to look at it. The butler who was nearby was shocked to see what room they had prepared, and the maid only said that for generations the owners of this castle had used this room for living, and that is why she decided that it would be the perfect room for the new queen. When the maid finished inspecting the room, she introduced two girls, Ella and Molly, who were supposed to be her own servants, but she refused arguing that she wanted to choose the people who would be with her all the time. The heroine was simply uncomfortable with the fact that one of the maids had the same name as one of those who betrayed her, and in the end, she told everyone that she was tired and needed to be left alone. When the butler went out into the corridor, he began to scold the senior maid for choosing this particular room. But she did not understand what the problem was, since the mistress had only used that room for a few years. 
The man did not believe that the maid did not know what happened in that room. Even the servants complained that they heard strange voices in that room. So why would the new lady of the castle move in there? And if the king found out about it, they would be in trouble. At that moment, Natalie was passing by and she took this chance and decided to eavesdrop on their conversation. The butler continued to scold the woman, saying that she should have asked him first and he would never have allowed them to give her that room. It was Miss Katrina who suggested this room, the maid said, after which the butler said that there was another mistress in the castle now and she should prioritize correctly. Realizing that they were arguing, the woman moved closer to hear better, but suddenly to her misfortune, a glass fell from the rack behind which she was hiding and broke, and the king's confidants noticed it immediately. The butler turned around and left, saying that she would take the king's anger on herself, and the elder went to take a closer look to avoid being found out. The nanny was saved by another servant who told the maid that she was wanted by Mrs. Katrina, and she went to her, ordering her to clean up the broken glass. In the office of the castle manager, the butler was pacing from side to side, which worried the man. He asked him not to worry, but the man did not understand the other's calmness. If the king found out about this incident, he would be very angry. Jansen didn't know who the head maid was, as Mrs. Katrina had kicked out the last woman who had worked here for over a decade. But in any case, he should have told them up front if he thought they could give the lady this room. Since the king had chosen this woman as a mate, they had no choice but to accept it. So he was sure that there would be no problems with her in the future. Lying in her room, the heroine thought that when she moved into the main castle, she decided to go to bed for some reason, so maybe she should go explore the castle. When she left the room, she met a guy who called himself Jansen. He said he wanted to meet her, and she noticed that he was the man she had seen in the garden, and his face was very familiar. The girl said that she wanted to see the castle, and the boy warned her that it was dangerous to walk alone in the castle because wild wolves often walk there, so he offered to accompany her, as he wanted to talk to her. Walking around the courtyard, the guy claimed that he had been ordered to hold the wedding as soon as possible, and it would take place in the chapel of the castle, and the girl did not mind, which reassured him. He thought that she would be upset by such a modest wedding, because weddings in Solstein must have been fancy, but the heroine was not in a position to wish for anything right now. It wasn't important to her. She wanted to get used to the place, and it would be nice to stop being treated like a stranger. Jansen was happy to hear that, assuring her that he thought she would be like the previous owner. Olivia Bangert, as a child, the heroine heard these gossips from her mother after she went to the north. The story about her changed many times. Even the most horrible gossips were circulating, so most people in the empire tried not to remember her, considering her a traitor. But the unpleasant gossip was never forgotten from the memory of the people. The boy could not say what kind of person she was, since he was still young. But judging by what he heard, she was very happy with her life here, even though she was brought here against her will. He also heard that she missed her home very much, yet the North does not recognize outsiders immediately, but it is unlikely that this made her feel lonely, so there were probably other reasons. Jansen advised asking Lady Katrina, who was the Chancellor's wife and also the King's aunt, who must have known the previous owner of the castle, but he could not guarantee that she would be willing to do so. Her Majesty, the previous mistress of the castle must have suffered greatly because of Lady Katrina, because afterwards she jumped out of the window, the boy said gloomily. The girl did not understand why he wanted to do this, because she was just a foreigner to them, to which Jansen assured her that Freddy's hair turned gray quickly due to stress, and he would not want the same thing to happen to him. After a moment of smiling, the guy said he was joking. He just wanted the woman to be strong because she was now the new mistress of the castle. Maybe she thought he was mocking her, but a real mistress should manage the castle properly, and that was the only advice he could give her at that moment. While on the balcony, the vice captain of the knights noticed two people talking downstairs, and then called out to the king to look himself, and he saw Jansen and Rosier, noting that they were probably discussing the wedding. The captain noticed that this woman could laugh beautifully, and he did not think that the new mistress would be so beautiful. The vice captain said that there were plenty of such beauties in the north, and the late mistress was even more beautiful, after which the captain elbowed him, showing with all his appearance that he had to choose his words in the presence of the king. 
The heroine went into her room and thought about Lady Katrina. If she rules this place, it means that she needs to be brought down to earth and shown that she is now the new mistress of the castle. In the room, an excited Natalie was waiting for her, asking her not to walk alone in this scary castle as wild animals roamed here, and therefore it was dangerous. Seeing the excitement in the nanny's eyes, the heroine asked her what had happened, and she said that she had accidentally heard a gray-haired man talking to the maid when she was passing by, and they were discussing the room. The woman did not hear exactly what they were talking about, but she assumed that something terrible had happened here in the past, and perhaps it was connected to the previous owner of the castle. And then, the girl remembered her recent conversation with Jansen, and that he said how the previous owner jumped out of the window and therefore asked to be left alone, saying goodbye, she went to the window, and stated that no matter what happened, she was not going to repeat her fate. The wedding day came, and Nanny, admiring the bride, assured her that she looked like a goddess who had come down from heaven to earth, and that she had never seen such a beautiful bride. And the girl realized that she was hearing this for the second time. They were sad that their parents could not be there. They would have been happy to see their daughter, and Natalie still had a hard time accepting that her mistress was finally getting married, because she had known the girl since she was born. Everyone was there. The captain and the vice-captain couldn't wait to see the heir apparent. Lady Ayla was almost in tears, and the groom was already waiting at the altar. The man gave her his hand, asking if she regretted her choice, because there was no turning back, but she was determined and decided to go all the way, despite all the problems that could happen on the way. Under the unkind gazes of the guests, the girl convinced herself that this was not a real wedding, and therefore she should not feel guilty or make a sad face, because it was all done by calculation. The priest was finishing his speech, but the heroine couldn't wait, so she interrupted him, saying what he said and declaring that she swore. Then he offered to seal the marriage with a kiss. The girl convinced herself that it was just a ceremony, so she would just touch his lips, and that would be it. But the king didn't seem to think so. So he took her and kissed her passionately. After the ceremony, they were greeted by Lady Katrina, who had been in charge of the castle until then, who congratulated them on their wedding and assured them that from now on there was a new owner in Chelevant, so they could feel at home. With a bit of gloating, the woman asked the bride how she liked the new room, but the heroine was ready for such a conversation. So she played along, saying that everything was very nice, especially the windows, but it would be worth changing the furniture and decorations. The girl said that she respected Mrs. Katrina's taste, but in her opinion, everything was too old-fashioned. The woman noticed that the bride came from a luxurious place, and therefore she liked wealth and glitter, and so she offered to renovate it. The heroine thanked them for their care and made a bold statement, saying that she would take care of her room herself, and she really lived in luxury and had no need for anything. Apparently, Lady Katrina could not imagine what it was like to live in such conditions. But from now on, she, a resident of the country of Helevant, and therefore will become the new mistress of the castle and will not follow the rules of Solstern. Katrina heard this statement and became visibly agitated, claiming that she was responsible for the order here. When she was refused, the woman broke down, apparently realizing that she had been exposed, shouted to her husband, thinking that he had told the queen everything, that she had never thought of harming anyone, and that she was doing a great job at the castle. At the end of the pre-planned conversation, the bride replied that she had no idea. Lady Katrina was tied to the castle, and perhaps it was not worth bringing up this topic on such a big day. So she suggested talking about it later, and that was the end of their dialogue. That same night, she was very glad to be done with it, as it was a very important moment. So any failure was unacceptable, and the king was not around. She hoped that he would never come to this room. It was a fun day today, but she was very tired, and then she fell asleep quietly. Her husband eventually came into the room, wondering how she had fallen asleep so early, but decided not to wake her up, as he realized how hard it had been, so he just laid down next to her. Looking at his bride, he did not understand why she had married him. Despite her confident tone, it was clear that she was afraid. A little woman who wanted to kill the emperor, what could make her dream of murder? The groom did not think that he would marry someone from there, 
because Solstern treats the Hellevant as barbarians, and therefore he never recognized the inhabitants of the Empire as normal people. But then why this woman? What her true goal was? He became more and more curious. He realized that now she was completely dependent on him, and if she was using him, then he had to use her. Suddenly she unconsciously hugged him, making him embarrassed, but he decided that he would not wake her up, and they slept in that position until the morning. In the morning, the girl held the blanket and could not understand why it was so hard and warm, and when she opened her eyes, she saw that she was touching the king's body, a realization that caused both panic and confusion. The groom was not at a loss, and threw the girl on her back, saying that if she was seeking this, she could be satisfied because she had succeeded in seducing him, to which she replied that this was not true, and she did not even know that he would lie down next to her. He took her and kissed her passionately, assuring her that she hadn't even noticed she was touching him, and yet she had to fulfill her duties as a wife. They were interrupted by a servant who brought an immediate message to the king. After listening to it, the man dressed in a hurry and said that he would not be gone long. But looking out the window, the woman noticed the army being built up and felt uneasy. In the hall, Jansen explained to the hostess that there was a lot of noise in the border areas, although usually the king would immediately lead the army. But now they seemed to have taken the wedding into account in their plans. The guy reassured the girl that everything would be fine and she would soon get used to it, as such events happened here regularly. But suddenly, they heard screams down the hall. They came closer, and it became clear that the sounds were coming from Miss Katrina. She scolded him and blamed the heroine for everything, saying that he should have married Miss Ayla, and then their families would have been strengthened, and their enemies would have been dealt with. Jansen wanted to intervene, but the woman didn't let him. There was also a butler in the room who listened to everything and then said that they couldn't oppose the king's will. And Katrina still said that this girl had disrupted all their plans and so she would make her do as she wanted. They left there, after which the guy apologized for the woman's behavior, assuring her that Lady Katrina was hysterical because she had been removed from her role as hostess. But it was not just that. Hellevant also had many enemies. While writing a letter in her room, the heroine heard strange sounds outside the door. Natalie was sleeping, so she decided to check what was going on there herself at her own risk. She saw the maids gathered around so she came closer, and when she saw the lady the girls parted, and a terrible picture presented itself to her eyes. The older maid was slapping the young worker's hands, assuring her that she was just teaching her a lesson. The woman remembered her as the girl who had been spying in the garden, and the maid assured her that this was a matter she should not get involved in. She had put on the wrong uniform and was therefore punished, said the elder, to which the woman asked with a somewhat sarcastic smile if all the noise was just because of a piece of fabric, and if so, she should have just pointed out the mistake, and the girl would have understood and stopped doing it. The woman asked if they were making so much noise on purpose so that she could hear it, and the maid immediately panicked, assuring her that this was not the case. The heroine carefully looked at everyone present and then asked what was the point of wearing such an ordinary uniform? When did this rule appear? And the elder answered that it appeared at the behest of Lady Katrina after the death of Queen Olivia. After hearing this and realizing how much influence Katerina has in this castle, the woman said that she was now their new mistress and the rules would be hers too. And the maid, not knowing what to do, said in despair that the castle was run by Miss Catrin. The new lady of the castle came closer and with a formidable expression asked only one question. Who does she serve, her or Katrina? The queen demanded an answer, but the maid did not hesitate to say that the answer was obvious, and they all served her. And then the woman asked why it was necessary to make all this noise in the castle and force the queen herself to come here. The maid bowed low and said that this would never happen again. The heroine ordered her to raise her head and said that from now on, all problems would be solved through her. She put it off for a while because of the ceremony, but now she wants to see the castle. So let the headmaid show her around tomorrow, and if she sees or hears anything like that again, they'll be in trouble. Finally, after handing them a letter to take to the butler, they said goodbye, and the woman turned to the young maid, handing her the rubber band that had been used to punish her. The young girl's name was Hannah. She said that her grandmother had given her the rubber band. 
The woman noticed that the girl even stuttered out of fear, and she looked completely innocent. As soon as she decided to treat her wounds, a guy ran up to them. It was Jansen. The maid saw him and was very confused and ran away. The boy saw it and asked what happened, but did not get an answer. He said that some carts appeared outside and the king would appear only tomorrow. They put on their cloaks and mounted their horses and rode toward the city. Katrina saw this through the window and realizing that this was her chance, she sent a man named Malik, ordering him to do everything quickly. They stopped near the city itself, and the woman stared at it in silence for a while, after which the guy said that everyone there was safe and that every citizen of the country was protected from monsters by their troops. Since ancient times, they have fought the monsters of the north, shedding blood for the sake of the people. But since the monsters have calmed down a bit for some reason, they don't have to fight as often now. And the south doesn't even consider them people. They call them barbarians, say they rape women, kill children, and burn people's houses. But if a permanent war started, they would take all the men, maybe not noticeably, but the current peaceful sky is the merit of the king. And then the heroine, remembering her past life, soon after Cassius came to the throne, a powerful army from the north attacked Solstern, and without any defense, the empire was defeated, and the soldiers plundered and burned the villages over and over again. Because of this abrupt change in events, the emperor took out all his anger on her, experienced all his resentment and fear, and put himself above others. Then she prayed every day, that Maxim Lanker would finally conquer Solstern and take the throne of the Emperor, and that Cassius himself would be killed in the most terrible way possible. Every day in the Empire was like hell, and on the very expected day, the army of the North destroyed the Empire together. The thought was interrupted by a guy who was curious about what the woman was thinking so deeply about, but she avoided such questions, so she asked where they should go next. After a little thought, the guy said that they were supposed to be met, the king was supposed to send someone here. After sniffing, the woman smelled the sea and said that she really wanted to see it. Her husband tried to convince her that it was not the right time, but gave up, and the heroine realized that it was time to inspect the area. There was a lot of bustle in the castle. The king and his soldiers arrived earlier than expected, so the castle was being prepared for his arrival. The butler was in charge of the maids, but he noticed that something was missing. It was the queen who was missing, but no one seemed to have warned her, and the head maid, who was now in the kitchen for some reason, was supposed to take care of it. At that moment, Katrina came up and said that there was no point in looking for them. As she had left the castle while the king was away, the soldiers had seen her leave, and when she went to check on her room, everyone said that the queen was ill and could not come out. Meanwhile, the king had already returned, and all his entourage were meeting him in the street. He noticed their surprise in the eyes of his people and asked what had happened, to which Katrina told him that the heroine had left the castle. The husband suspected something was wrong, and Freddy, the butler, refuted his wife's statement, saying that the entire castle neighborhood was under strict security, so she could not have left alone. Katrina suggested that the king check this information himself, Perhaps the queen was so sick that she could not even come to the meeting, after which the king went to check it himself. He did not believe that she had been deceiving him all this time. When he came into the room, he saw her, and she apologized for not coming out earlier because she hadn't had time to get ready. Katrina couldn't believe her eyes, she was sure, since she had sent a trusted person, and then asked if she had been here all the time, since the woman had come in several times today and then heard that she had been feeling sick all day. The king let her go to rest if she didn't feel well, when suddenly the heroine realized that it was time to show herself as a beloved couple. She hugged him, saying that she had been waiting for him to return for a very long time and really wanted to spend time together, which shocked everyone present. And then, to end the performance, she asked everyone to leave them alone and bring them something to eat. The king was taking a bath, and the woman was mentally preparing herself for what was about to happen. She was terribly ashamed, although she convinced herself that it was normal. So she decided to drink wine to calm herself down. Before changing the story, the heroine realized something. She had never experienced true love from her legitimate husband, and there was no family warmth that she should have had.
Perhaps if Cassius had loved her, things could have been different. She lay on the bed, wondering if things would be the same now, and what she should do if they were. The king noticed the strange behavior and decided to say something, something strange. But the girl thought that it looked like she was hinting at something again, so she decided that this could not go on. After drinking wine, the queen, gathering all her will in her fist, opened the curtains to the bathroom where her husband was, which shocked the servants nearby, and then said she would help him, so she took the brush. While washing, Maxim asked her if she was waiting for him. She confirmed it, and then he took her hand and pulled her closer to him, saying that she was waiting for him, afraid that the plans might be ruined. The woman confirmed this too, but said that she was nevertheless waiting very much. He said that he also did not like it when plans were ruined, and therefore it was necessary to take the matter more seriously, for the hostess to have status in the castle, she must have a good connection with her husband. The woman's alcohol began to wear off, so her shyness returned, and her husband assured her that even on the battlefield he was thinking about her all the time and wanted to see her, so he decided to make sure of his feelings. After that, he suddenly kissed her, as passionately as the first time, and when he finished, the woman began to feel dizzy, and her husband noticed that she had a fever, so he called the butler to run to the doctor. A little later, Jansen came to ask how the queen was doing, saying that she was caught in a heavy rain and apparently forgave her. The king noticed that if she was caught in the rain, then she was outside, realizing that he would not get out of it. The guy decided to tell the truth. They went out to the outskirts of the castle and went into the dungeons. Although he knew that the king was supposed to return the next day, the boy said uncertainly, because of the situation, and so to understand everything better, he suggested that they go down and see for themselves. When they went downstairs, they saw the body of a man. He had been strangled, and it seems that he was killed to keep him silent. So judging by this, the castle is not very safe now, and therefore it was necessary to know the suspects. When she woke up in her bed the next day, she did not immediately understand what had happened. But the situation was changed by a worried nanny who assured her that she should not get up and she had sat all night without closing her eyes, and the king was here to inquire about her condition. Hearing about her husband, the queen became agitated and was kindly covered in a blanket. She realized that everything was going wrong again, and he was already aware of her condition. Walking around the castle, the heroine had an uneasy feeling that she was being watched, so she went to tell Jansen everything. He listened to the situation and then offered to make a trap for him. The queen realized that Katrina had done it, and meanwhile Jansen came to her to inform her of the assassin's death, and she realized that they decided to get rid of him immediately when it became clear that he had failed in his task. The next day, she was feeling better, and by coincidence, on that day they received a parcel from Saul Stern, and when she saw everything with her own eyes, she realized that it was her parents who sent it. It was the Etchwell family carriage. The queen almost burst into tears when she saw all the jewelry and expensive clothes, and she would have ordered everything to be moved to the guest room next to her room, dreaming of trying it all on. While she was reading the letter, Jansen told her that it was probably a gift for the king, and that the parcel should be taken to him, to which she reluctantly agreed. A little later, the butler told the queen that she had guests, three girls, and they came inside and were amazed at everything they saw. The woman invited everyone to the table apologizing for not inviting them earlier, as she had not been feeling well lately. Sitting at the same table and drinking tea, the girls discussed everyday affairs, the management of the castle, and in passing also mentioned Lady Katrina, they were surprised that the woman was still holding out under her pressure. But the girls chose their words very carefully, as they understood that they had to be on good terms with the new queen, and the girl's genealogy also came up in the conversation, and the heroine realized that Katrin was not from the north. The woman decided to ask for more details about Miss Katrina. She realized that this could help her in her future struggle, and the girls, surprised by this lack of knowledge, said that she was from the west. When she was young, she was married to a certain Chancellor Pierre, but after his death she left her country and remarried here, at which point there was a big scandal as pure pedigree was valued at the time. But now the place of the owner of the castle was fully transferred to the heroine, which they congratulated. And the queen in turn realized that she did not know Miss Katrina at all, 
and this was a very interesting detail. The girls continued to say things they might later regret, claiming that this was why Katrina wanted to marry her niece Ayla to the king, and she had spent a lot of energy on it. When the queen heard the familiar name, she asked the girls to tell her more about it. But they, realizing that they had already said too much, assured her that she shouldn't know, but she only noticed that if that was the case, why was it necessary to mention it at all? It all sounded very suspicious, 